reconvene the meeting um, and call Amendment 112 in the name of Mark Ruskell, already debated with Amendment 110. Uh, Mark, would you like to move or not move? Um, I'm not going to move that. Thank you. I call Amendment 63 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment Moved. 60. Thank you. question is that Amendment 63 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. We are. And the question is that Section 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Right, I call Amendment 64 in the name of Angus MacDonald, grouped with Amendment 65. I call on Angus MacDonald to move Amendment 64 and speak to both amendments in the group. OK, uh, thanks, convener. <coughs> um, I've lodged these amendments to meet the recommendations in our committee's Stage 1 report that any future regulations seeking Parliament's agreement to the use of carbon credits as a way of meeting climate change targets should be subject to an enhanced affirmative procedure. Uh, and at this point, can I thank the Government for its assistance in, in preparing these amendments. Section 14 of the Bill introduces a, a new Section 13A to the 2009 Act which sets a limit of zero for using carbon amendments, but allows regulations to raise that limit. Uh, and as committee colleagues are aware, uh, the Cabinet Secretary stated that the government's policy is not to use carbon credits. Section 97 of the 2009 Act sets out an enhanced pre-laying procedure uh, for certain regulation making powers under that Act, such as those around deposit return. Uh, the second of my amendments ensures that the regulation making power in Section 13A of the Bill in relation to carbon credits will come under those same enhanced procedures. So that will mean the following requirements. An initial draft set of regulations must be laid in Parliament and consulted upon over a representation period. This representation period must be at least 90 days, including at least 30 sitting days. Ministers must have regard to any representations made to them during the representation period, including to any parliamentary resolution or report. And finally, when the draft regulations are subsequently laid in Parliament, ministers must lay a statement setting out details of any representations, resolutions or reports, any changes made in response. So my amendments also retain from the current bill provisions an additional safeguard to ensure that it will be made clear whether the proposals in any such regulations are consistent with up-to-date advice from the Committee on Climate Change. The First Amendment is consequential to the second and removes subsection 13A brackets 5 inserted by section 14 of the Bill. This would have required Ministers to publish a statement alongside the regulations. Such a provision will now be made under the amended section 97. These amendments will ensure a very strong level of scrutiny as called for by this committee, should any future government seek to raise the permitted level for the use of carbon credits from the default position of zero. Happy to move. Thank you. And any other members want to speak on that? Cabinet Secretary. As the committee is aware, this government's policy is that Scotland's emission reductions, emissions reduction targets should be met through domestic effort alone without the use of carbon credits. We've been absolutely clear on that. The bill establishes a statutory default limit on the use of credits of zero for all future targets, uh, target years. No, nonetheless, the advice from the CCC has been to retain a limited ability to use credits in the future should circumstances change. And so we've allowed for this possibility in the bill, subject to the CCC so advising and the Parliament agreeing affirmative procedure regulations. This means that the Parliament's explicit approval would already be needed to any proposal to any increase in the limit from zero. The committee has asked for even higher scrutiny for any such regulations, and I'm content, as I said in my letter last week, to support Angus MacDonald's amendments 64 and 65. These will require any such regulations be subject to an enhanced pre-laying procedure that is already defined in the 2009 Act. I'd hope that this would provide the committee with full assurance that any change in Scotland's approach to meeting its climate targets from a future government will be carefully scrutinised. Thank you. I'd like to give Angus MacDonald the opportunity to wind up and press or withdraw the amendment. Uh, <coughs> nothing uh, to say to wind up, uh, but happy to press the amendment. Thank you. The question then is that Amendment 64 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 65 in the name of Angus MacDonald, already debated with Amendment 64. Would you like to move or not move that amendment? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 65 be agreed. Are we all agreed? <coughs> we are. 
And the question is that section 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. question is that section 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Right. Now, we uh, now call amendment 113 in the name of Claudia Beamish. Uh, group with amendments as shown in the, the groupings. I remind members that in light of the presiding officer's determination on costs of the amendments 113 and 114 in this group, both amendments can be debated and moved, but the questions cannot be put on whether or not to agree to them. Now, um, Claudia has had to step out and Mark Ruskell has agreed to step into her shoes uh, briefly to move amendment 113 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Um, Thanks very much, convener. And there are a number of amendments in this group, including uh, my own, which look at the establishment of a just transition commission. So I, I will, I will um, get started on it. Um, these amendments established the just transition commission in statute uh, in this bill and put in place a range of planning, reporting and consulting processes. They're aimed at integrating the just transition into the bill's existing processes. The Commission would, in addition, have the power to publish reports as it considers appropriate in relation to its functions and the just transition principles, and would also publish an annual report. Now, as committee members know, uh, we believe strongly that a just transition is an imperative in our response to climate change and should be at the core of all actions. This bill was introduced to the Scottish Parliament as a direct response to the Paris Agreement. And of course, the Paris Agreement requires parties to increase action to reduce emissions while taking into account, and I quote, the imperatives of a just transition of the workforce and the creation of decent work and quality jobs. The vital importance of the just transition approach to realizing the transformation to a low carbon economy and net zero has been recognized in establishing the Just Transition Commission. And I welcome its work and congratulate the Scottish Government on setting this up. However, its two-year term is not sufficient to contributing to assisting ministers delivering on the targets in the bill and responding properly to the climate emergency. We all know there is a need for urgent action in the coming decade and then continuing onwards to 2045. And I want the bill to enshrine just transition processes in a meaningful and long-term way. Doing so will also help in generating and maintaining public support for the action required to meet the targets. Workers worried about their jobs across the range of sectors, affected communities, and the young people striking for their future want to know that we recognize their fears and concerns and will ensure the transition is fair for all. Having a statutory long-term commission for the duration of the targets in the bill would be a practical, in our view, an absolutely necessary demonstration of commitment to this just transition. Advice from an independent body on implementing the transition is something we have all welcomed. The trade unions through the STUC and environment groups working together through the JTC partnership have argued for a statutory just transition commission, and that is what these amendments seek to establish. Stop Climate Chaos supports this, and I know many people across the country are watching today to see whether this committee supports these amendments. If we are to create a fair, high-value work, if we are to create socially and environmentally sustainable jobs while meeting our targets, planning is key, and expert advice on how to do it is fundamental in an ongoing, robust, long-term way, whoever is in government. The Scottish Government suggests that putting the transition reporting in the climate plan is sufficient for the longer-term action, but we disagree and see a clear need to build on the work of the existing Commission. Our amendments do not affect the work of Professor Jim Ski and his colleagues. It is feasible to transition from the existing commission when it reports at the end of the two years to the new statutory commission. And we have the example of the Poverty and Inequality Commission for that, of the Public Service Reform Order that comes into effect on the 1st of July this year. The Land Commission, this committee of course will be aware of and that it actually appointed the Land Commission, also sets a confidence building precedent. The JCC must have regard to the principles listed in, in the amendments put forward on climate justice and the just transition by creating quality jobs, protecting the rights of the workforce and affected communities and enhancing social justice while sharing the costs and rewards fairly and engaging workers, their unions and employers with the plans needed for a just transition. So I commend these principles to the committee. 
The functions seek to ensure that the Commission is enabled to deliver on those principles, providing crucial advice to ministers and with important reporting duties and powers to ensure the best possible advice for a just transition in which the costs and rewards are shared fairly and report on measures put in place to ensure that livelihoods of workers and communities are protected and social equity is enhanced. Would the member in charge like to come move That's the rest? That's at the bottom of the page with a convener's agreement. I apologise for having to go, but yeah, I had a... You will have the opportunity to wind up. Yeah. Um, so maybe you can pick up on that. But, yeah, uh, right, yeah. right, I'd then like to ask Mark Ruskell to move Amendment 113A. Sorry, there's, there, there's more... Oh, is there? Sorry, sorry. Right, OK. Yeah. Um, <sighs> That's what, what I was saying. If I, if uh, you, When you get to the right. bottom of the page, if I can continue with your agreement... At a point... What, Hand it over to okay. Claudia and she yep. can finish off. It's a, it's a double act today. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so such a commission can assist the Scottish Government overcome barriers to change and engage the active participation of workers, trade unions, businesses, the public sector and wider civic society. It's also important the Commission can, can conduct research and advocate to relevant organisations for the adoption of measures to support this just transition. And we've included a clause on procurement which would be extremely helpful to prevent the kind of betrayal of the workforce that's happened with BIFAB and to support our renewable industries and ensuring the creation of quality jobs here, helping make sure individuals and communities are not left behind. Fife is ready for renewal. We must make sure Scotland as a whole is ready for renewal. It is the demands of the workers, the communities and trade unions and environment groups who come together to demand a just transition for the benefit of everyone that we must respond to today. I'd like to just hand over to... Thank you. Ms. Um, uh, I must say, I, I would really like to extend my thanks to Mark Ruskell, and uh, it is a double act, and perhaps it's rightly so. Um, they happen to be my amendments, but we, we are both, as parties and as individuals, very committed to the just transition. Uh, so we're down to... In announcing the appointment of Professor Jim Skier as chair of the current commission late last year, the cabinet secretary said that it was important that no one is left behind as the employment landscape shifts. Putting the commission onto a statutory basis is a major building block on how we deliver on that commitment. I want to highlight the financial issues. Members will know that the presiding officer has ruled that amendments 113 and 114, which established the commission, um, are uh, beyond the costing of the bill and are estimated at um, over £700,000 in, in the longer term. The Scottish Government voted to, I quote, give consideration, unquote, to a statutory commission. Um, and it's disappointing that the costs rule this out today, but I do respect the fact that if there isn't a financial um, memorandum, uh, that's, that's where we are. And I do strongly request that the Scottish Government and Cabinet Secretary commit today to publishing a financial resolu resolution, um, rather than memorandum, apologies, for the bill ahead of stage three, which there is fortunately ample time to do. We know the cost of inaction far outweighs the cost of action on this issue of fairness, and I do not think the estimated cost would be excessive for the kind of commission that is required. Uh, I, I would be appreciative um, if you could review your pr approach, Cabinet Secretary, on a long-term statutory commission in this context, and it is very much needed to ensure we deal with the recent climate emergency as well in a fair way, and in my view, would be money well spent. Amendment 114 makes further provision about the Commission. It includes on membership that one member should be a nominee of the trade union movement. That is the case with the existing Commission, and it makes sense to continue that provision, given the importance trade unions in, uh, make in the just transition case internationally, and have done so over many years, and the importance of involving workers in plans, more specifically here in Scotland, for the just transition. It also asks that one member be a representative with experience of ecological and environmental matters, and again, that is the case with the existing Commission. The Commission as a whole, as you would expect, should have experience in or knowledge of the formulation, implementation, evaluation of policies relating to the environment and climate change and the economy, industrial transition and social inclusion. 
113 establishes the Commission and 114 makes further provision in Schedule 3. The other amendments in this group speak to invaluable advice and monitoring the Commission would be in a position to provide long term. The amendments taken together will ensure a robust process whereby ministers must consult with the Commission in relation to emissions target reports, climate plans and climate um, uh, annual uh, reporting, uh, sorry, progress reports. They specify how just transition in accordance with the just transition principles should be integral to climate planning and annual progress reports and how these reports should include the views of the Commission. Amendment 151 ensures that the Scottish Ministers consult the Commission when preparing a climate change annual report and 115 requires that Ministers must consult the Commission in preparing a report on emissions reduction targets. 141 states that the plan must set out, with reference to the climate justice principles, how the proposals and policies in the plan are expected to affect different sectors in the economy, different regions, importantly, including any effect on employment. The plan should also set out the measures w which will put in place uh, the support, the transition of the workforce and related communities in affected sectors and regions, as well as the investment needed to implement the proposals and policies set out in the plan and the anticipated sources of that investment. 143 ensures that ministers must consult the Commission before preparing a climate change plan and the Commission's advice on the climate change plan is therefore crucial to integrating just transition into all that we do to meet the targets. We need ministers to take account of the Commission's advice and 144 will ensure or would ensure that ministers do this and that their statement laying the plan before the Scottish Parliament sets out details of the views of the Commission and changes, if any, that are made in response to the reasons for these changes. 150 ensures that the annual progress reports covering each substantive chapter of the most recent climate change plan must include the views of the Commission. These are all crucial parts of monitoring progress in a just way, in my view. Finally, 154 adds the establishment of the Just Transition Commission into the long title. Let us all consider supporting, not today, but leading towards stage three, um, with a net zero emissions in Scotland, which can now be underpinned by the thrust of these amendments, which are supported by the Just Transition Partnership, including a range of unions and NGOs, Stop Climate Chaos, the STUC, and many, many more people across Scotland. Thank you. Move your amendment 113. I don't know. Am I allowed? You're to? allowed to move it. We just can't vote on it. Thank you. I would like to move it, please. Okay. Uh, now call Mark Ruskell to move amendment 113A and speak to all amendments in the group. Yeah, thanks, convener. And this is um, obviously um, part of a, of a set of amendments um, that, that have already been, um, you know, the, the framework of which has already been introduced. Um, so 113A um, is about establishing a citizens' assembly and. MSPs will be aware that there are there are many hundreds of people um, outside this parliament today that are calling for that. And really, this is about the heart of democracy. It is about ensuring that on this very difficult journey we're going to have to make, um, where there's probably going to have to be massive behavioural change, there's going to be controversial decisions that we need to be to be made about our society, that we that we take people with us. Um, and I think there's been some you know excellent work done in Scotland uh, engaging with. The wider population um you know this committee uh, has engaged in, in some recent citizens jury work which i think has been uh, very positive and i'm sure we'll, we'll report in due pro uh, in due um in, in due course but the, the idea of a citizen assembly of taking some of the harder choices that we're going to have to make and taking that out to the people and, and getting ordinary people to really consider these options and to think about how we can bring about these changes, I think will be extremely important. And what we don't want to see is going forward a kind of um, a response to climate crisis that results in a sort of gilet jaune type movement. You know, we have to take people with us, we have to take workers with us, we have to take communities with us and, and wider citizens as well. So the concept, the idea of a citizens assembly, I think is a good one. Um, we see the first minister uh, reflecting on it in relation to our, our, our future constitutional decisions as well in Scotland. And it's being used um, in, in many other contexts um, 
globally as well. So I think for this climate crisis, we, we need to understand the views of citizens. We need to understand how they may, re they may react to some of the hard choices that, that will be required. Um, so that's that amendment. The other two amendments um, in my name, uh, 145 and uh, 146, are really in relation to the climate plan. It's ensuring that the climate plan does cover this issue about just transition, that it's integral uh, to the way that we plan and uh, report on our progress towards tackling the climate emergency. And um, I'm happy to, uh, to move those amendments along with 113A. Okay, thank you. I um, ask the Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment 75, another amendment <coughs> in the group. Um, thank you, Convener. I'll begin by describing the Government's amendments to place internationally recognised just transition principles on the face of the Bill. Scotland's transition to net zero must be just and fair to everyone to ensure that the concept of just transition is to be at the heart of future climate change plans. I've brought forward Amendment 75, 83 and 86. Amendment 83 sets out the just transition principles. Whilst there is not a universally accepted single definition of just transition, the principles contained in my amendment are an accurate reflection of international labour organisation principles as they apply in the Scottish context. Such principles were, of course, agreed by this Parliament as the right ones for Scotland following January's debate on just transition. Ministers may modify the principles by secondary legislation as provided for by Amendment 83. These regulations will be subject to the affirmative procedure, so Parliament would have to explicitly agree any changes. It is important that the just transition principles have a clear application in practice, as such, Amendment 75 requires ministers to have regard to the principles in preparing climate change plans. It also imposes a duty on ministers to set out how the just transition principles were taken into account in preparing the plan. Finally, Amendment 86 is a minor amendment and inserts the definition of principles into the interpretation section of the 2009 Act. And I'm now going to turn to Claudia Beamish's suite of amendments to establish a statutory just transition commission. At the outset, I'd emphasise that there already is an active non-statutory commission, referred to by others, undertaking this important work in Scotland. The commission will be providing practical advice by early 2021. The government has been carefully considering the establishment of a just transition uh, commission on a statutory footing and exploring ideas with stakeholders. However, it remains unclear what additional value would be gained by establishing a body on a statutory basis. Although you'll not be voting on amendments 113 and 114 today, I thought it would be worth setting out my position on this specific set of proposals for a statutory commission. Firstly, I'm not persuaded that a commission would need body corporate status to be effective. And I further note that such an approach has likely been a factor in the significant cost estimates arrived at by the Parliament. Um, the Parliament's estimates and our estimates are not exactly the same, um, but I need to make people understand that these are annual costs. This is not a one-off setup. This is the annual cost for running a statutorily based Just Transition Commission. And I perhaps ought to say that the estimated annual cost is significantly greater than the current Scottish Government contribution to the committee on climate change costs. Secondly, I'm not sure that I see the value of adding a specific duty for the Commission to consult a citizens assembly. The current Commission is already working across the country, engaging with those likely to affect and be affected by the transition. We've ensured that dialogue and engagement are crucial to the current Commission's remit. The amendment would provide for an extremely broad role for the proposed Commission, including functions that are already delivered by the CCC, and others that are delivered by government or parliament. I'd hope that Claudia Beamish would not press the other amendments in this grouping that are directly associated with the establishment of the proposed commission, given that this cannot itself be voted on today. I do see merit in Claudia Beamish's amendment 141 to require climate change plans to include assessments of how the policies and proposals to reduce emissions will affect matters related to a just transition. There is a degree of overlap between this and my own Amendment 75. I do have some concerns about aspects of Amendment 141 as drafted, but I appreciate the desire for more specific reporting requirements in this space. If Claudia Beamish would be content to not press Amendment 141 at the present time, I'd be pleased to work with her over the summer to bring back some elements of it in a revised form 
for stage three. Uh, however, I couldn't support it if she's going to press it now. Similarly, I see merit in Mark Ruskell's amendments 145 and 146 to require climate change plan monitoring reports to include an assessment of progress towards a just transition as defined by a set of just transition principles. My only substantial difficulty with these amendments is that there are, of course, now multiple sets of principles being discussed around the various bill amendments. As such, I'd also invite Mark Ruskell not to press these amendments at this time on the understanding that the government will support amendments with the same intention at stage three. There's no doubt about the importance of ensuring Scotland's journey to net zero emissions is a just one. My amendments place these matters squarely on the face of the bill and will ensure they are embedded in policies developed through climate change plans. I'm open to working with members to further refine these approaches in advance of stage three. Keir Stewart Stevenson would like to speak to these amendments. Uh, thank you very much, uh, convener. I mean, it's worth saying there are more words in the amendments here than we actually uh, spent discussing just transition during the stage one process. So I've come from a viewpoint that if you were to require something of this scale and complexity to establish the Just Transition Commission, it should be a bill on its own with a proper consultation that would uh, help come up with the result. But that's for another day. Um, my own uh, personal calculation of the cost of this uh, is between three and five million pounds per annum, um, because I think uh, looking at the workload, it's about 50 civil servants are required uh, to deliver. Um, I, I have run groups that have lesser responsibilities, so I'm using personal experience to come up with my views. But they're only a guess. They're not uh, they're anything like uh, the final word on the thing. Now, turning to the detail of what's in front of us, uh, in, in particular, uh, looking at uh, 114, um, uh, paragraph 2, in performing its function, the Commission is not subject to the direction or control of any member of the Scottish Government. Now, that seems to run against the Scottish Government being able to ask for advice, because that's a form of direction and control. So I'm not terribly clear uh, how, how that works in relation to other parts of uh, uh, the, the, the amendments. Um, the, the next thing, if we move down to four, under resources, um, we've got Scottish ministers to provide the Commission with such staff and other resources as it requires to carry out its function. Um, that seems to suggest that the Commission itself uh, is in control of that and represents a blank cheque. Um, that's where you might find it's hundreds of servants and the legislation would require the government to provide uh, that number of civil servants. Um, on membership, um, at 3.2, um, I don't in any sense object to a nominee from the trade union movement, but I'm not entirely clear why there's not a nominee from farming. I'm not clear why there's not a nominee from academia. I'm not clear why there's not a nominee from young people, from business, and so on. So, uh, no objection whatsoever to the trade unions being there, as they are in the present uh, commission. Uh, incidentally, the community and myself had lunch yesterday uh, with a young member of the existing uh, commission, and, and, and uh, a very excellent contribution, I'm sure, uh, she will be uh, making. Um, now... Uh, very briefly, yes, if I may. Um, uh, I, I, I thank the member for taking a brief intervention. Um, on, on the membership under two, um, I appreciate that, that this um, is not going to be voted on today and could be developed if indeed there was any um, will to take it forward. But um, it was particularly the trade union movement and um, a representative with um, experience and knowledge of ecological and environmental matters because... Um, uh, just to be quite frank about that, those are the groups that have pushed this forward and uh, in my view they are at the heart of where we're going and, um, and sometimes frankly the trade unions particularly can be left out so I wanted to be sure that that was so. Well if, if, if it may briefly pick up on that, when I was climate change minister the first group I went and spoke to was a CBI group with 80 people in the room in 2007 
very enthusiastic. So the member should not imagine that other parts of uh, Scotland are not deeply interested in this subject. Uh, and, and I'm talking about who I work but, with. But, but anyway, we're not disagreeing on the subject, so, uh, or at least I'm trying, not seeking to disagree. Um, the, the, on the list of people who are disqualified from being uh, on the Commission, I, I'm quite content, but there's a significant omission from the list, and that is members of the House of Lords. Now, much as I think uh, George Fawkes would be welcomed back into decision-making in Scotland, he and other members of the House of Lords are lawmakers, and therefore their role as lawmakers would conflict with this. Um, the way insolvency and company directed disqualification and charity crust is dealt with is very unfortunate because it says is or has been insolvent. So even if your insolvency is discharged, you are disbarred. Even if your disqualification as a company director is dealt with, you are discharged. And even more fundamentally, when we get to uh, see has been disqualified, etc., etc., anywhere in the world. I'm absolutely uncertain how it would be possible with any reliability uh, to know about that. And similarly, the anywhere in the world appears uh, elsewhere. Um, resignation, we've got uh, that you can resign to the presiding officer of the Scottish Parliament, even though the presiding officer of the Scottish Parliament has no role in appointments, which I found uh, a, little, a little bit baffling. And I'm only dipping into quite a wide range of concerns I've got about the way it's drafted. I'm not seeking to engage the broad principle because I'm strongly supportive of a just transition commission. I'm just pretty certain that what's in front of us is not the way to do it. Convener. John Scott would like to speak to these amendments. Yes, very briefly, Convener. I thank you for that opportunity. And, and while I support the work of the Just Transmission too, I believe it should not be on a statutory basis. I welcome the Scottish Government's offer to look further at this at stage three. I think that's very, very welcome. And I hope the Government will look at this on a voluntary basis. And I support most of what Stuart Stevenson has said. I'm not entirely sure what he said about George Fawkes, his friend and mine. <laughs> Thank you. And now give uh, Claudia Beamish the opportunity to wind up. Right, thank you, convener. Um, I want to start just by commenting on what Stuart Stevenson has said, not on the detail of it, but um, it is a very complex matter and uh, um, to set up a new commission. And uh, I think this is the place to do it. And I think um, if there is a um, financial resolution through the summer with the agreement of the Scottish Government, then um, these issues that were raised can be refined. Um, and I, I want then to turn to Mark Ruskell's amendment. Um, I'm hoping that none of the um, consequential amendments will actually be moved today because I think um, how um, a Just Transition Commission, if we go forward on it, is crafted is something that all those um, who have shown a, a keen and strong interest and support for it, such as Mark Ruskell, it would be helpful if those issues could be looked at together. Um, and uh, I, I have one concern about um, the declaration and request um, from Extinction Rebellion, but this is not the only group that's asking for a Citizens' Assembly on Climate Change, is um, that one of the aims of the group is that politicians should be led by uh, a Citizens' Assembly, and my view is that in a parliamentary democracy we should be inspired by and informed by and encouraged by, but not actually led by. And so, uh, just at the moment, I think there's some clarification needed on that, and I do stress that I'm not against the idea, and I'm keenly aware that whether um, this proceeded um, or not through the auspices of the Scottish Government um, as, as a wider issue, the Commission itself, that um, uh, there are issues, over, that there is to be a public engagement over the summer by the um, Scottish Government, and so, um, it might possibly be uh, appropriate um, for the Scottish Government and the Cabinet Secretary to consider um, more detachment from the Scottish Government in this process, such as um, happened with the citizens' jury of 12 people who were um, actually um, 
connected with our, our committee, which I found interesting and important. After all, one of the most important aspects of this, which I haven't highlighted in my remarks, um, is behaviour change across not only affected workers and communities, uh, but also civic society. Um, I am supportive of the Cabinet Secretary's principles um, uh, for just transition. However, um, I am going to be supportive of them today if they are moved. However, I am somewhat wary that these will become a, 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 a sort of alternative which really, in my view, is simply not good enough as we drive forward one of the most challenging issues um, of, of our day, if not the most ta challenging uh, global and Scot Scotland-wide issue, that this will become instead of, rather than uh, parallel with, um, the Commission. And so I'm wary of doing it, but I will support them because I, I believe in them. Um, in terms of the reporting requirements, I'm pleased to have the offer um, from the Cabinet Secretary in relation to my 141, if I've got that right, um, to discuss issues over the summer, and I think that's important. Um, and uh, I've, I've written down here um, about the House of Lords, and that's rather... I started off with Stuart Stevenson's um, comments, and I would highlight that I had no intention that members of the House of Lords should be, be part of this, So, um, despite um, respect for George Fuchs. Okay. So there we go. Thank you. Um, oh, are you... That's it? Yep, thank you. I'd, I'd like to invite uh, Mark Ruskell to wind up and press or withdraw his amendment. 113A. Um, yeah, thanks, convener. Um, I don't think I've really got much more to say on this. I mean, I think in, in answer to Claudia Beamish's clarification about how a citizen assembly would work, um, I, I agree with her. I, I think we've got a very clear role in this parliament as decision makers. Um, and there will be some extremely tough decisions for us to make and for our successors to make in the decades to come. I do think, though, that needs to be informed by the real lived experiences of people out there. And I think that is the critical lesson from the Gilets Jaunes movement. The government in France did not listen to the impact on the people. And that's why I think it's hugely important that we reach beyond the individuals in this room. We reach beyond kind of conventional forms of consulting with people through emails and everything else. We actually go to affected communities. And we take the, the information, the lived experiences back, and then that helps to inform the decisions that we then make as elected politicians. I think that's the right way around. That does differ from what Extinction Rebellion are calling for, but I think it's critical that we do involve the citizenry in the decisions that we, that we make. Um, I think I'll just leave it. Perhaps just the last point I would, I would make. Um, it, it, you know, whatever government decides to do on this, and it looks like government at the moment is minded to not, um, set a statutory basis to the Just Transition Commission. We, we have got to learn the history here of, of what has happened to similar commissions, particularly at Westminster, where the government down there, um, the coalition government, abolished the Sustainable Development Commission. Now, think now what use the Sustainable Development Commission we would have in, in debating this bill, in taking advice, in looking at the biodiversity crisis. You know, we lost, we lost a hugely important part of our government and our advisory um, infrastructure and, and that was a, just a decision that a government made. I don't want to see the same thing happen to the Just Transition Commission. I suspect it won't happen with this government but I do worry about future governments coming in and effectively just wiping this away. Thank you. The question then is that Amendment 1 oh yeah, you want to, do you want to press? So I'm not going to press it at this point? Ah, you're not? No. Okay. Okay and you're going to withdraw 1138. Members satisfied? Anyone have any objections to that? No? And I remind members that I can't put the question on Amendment 113 for the reasons I've already given. Okay, um, I call Amendment 114 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 113, and ask Claudia Beamish if she wants to move or not move this amendment. 114. Am, am I allowed to move? I don't no, understand. Move yeah, you, you can move it, but we're not voting on it. <laughs> Sorry. Just seems a, a contradiction in terms, but never mind. I move it. You move it. And mem mem no, members. I'm sorry. I, I forgot I was able to. I'm not going to move it because of the comments that were made by right. some of the members. I'm very committed to the Just Transition Commission on statutory basis, but I think um, it, 
I don't want to move it at this stage. Right, okay, so you're not going to move it. No. Okay, right, we then move on to... Just give me a second. I call Amendment 66 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 60. Would the Cabinet Secretary like to move that formally? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 66 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call Amendment 67 in the name of Stuart Stevenson and a group on its own. Stuart Stevenson to move and speak to Amendment 67. Uh, thank you, Kimira. I've lodged an amendment to remove the wording insofar reasonably practical uh, from Section 33.3a as substituted by Section 16 of the Bill. This section relates to the methods used when reporting targets in line with target relevant international carbon reporting practice. In other words, the technical implementation of the inventory freeze calculation recommended by the Committee on Climate Change in December 2017. One of the provisions in the bill as introduced was that such calculations should be done in a manner insofar as reasonably practical with the advice on this from the relevant body, i.e. the Climate Change Committee. This committee noted some concerns in our stage one report that the government might not use the calculation method specified by the CCC. I note that the Cabinet Secretary stated in her response to our Stage 1 report that the Government's intention was always to follow the method recommended by the Climate Change Committee and that the Bill provision represented a standard drafting fail-safe. However, my amendment puts this beyond doubt by removing the clause insofar as reasonably practical. This will have the effect that Scottish Ministers must follow the calculation method set out by independent expert advisers fully and exactly. This is consistent with my comments on Group 2 in taking the committee, on taking the committee's advice. This provides assurance that this important but relatively complex aspect to the Bill Target Framework is entirely objective in its implementation. Thank you. Are there any... Uh, would you like to move? Uh, I move. Yeah. Uh, any other members like to... No? Cabinet Secretary. I'm happy to support Stuart Stevenson's Amendment 67, which relates to the technical calculation methods used for the purpose of reporting target outcomes under the inventory freeze method advised by the CCC in its December 2017 report. I thought it would be helpful to briefly put the government's position on record, although this may mean I cover some of the ground already covered by Stuart Stevenson. In the Stage 1 report, the committee raised concerns over Section 16 of the Bill, which suggested that the government might choose to follow an alternative calculation methodology for applying the inventory freeze method to the one advised from the relevant body, that is the CCC. Our intention was always to use the calculation methodology that has been advised by the CCC for these matters. The inclusion of the reference to doing so, uh, quotes, insofar as reasonably practicable, unquote, uh, clause in section 163A of the bill was intended as a safeguard in the very unlikely event that the CCC recommended in the future an alternate method that was technically impossible to deliver, for example, due to data availability considerations. However, given the very low magnitude of this risk and the committee's desire for assurance on these matters, I'm content to support the present amendment. This will mean that the calculation methodology used will always be exactly as recommended by the CCC until such a time as the CCC may update their advice on this method. This will be the one set out in their December 2017 report, a worked example of which was provided to the committee in my response to the stage one report. Um, and, convener, I should say that nothing I have said in this statement in any way um, uh, leads to me agreeing with the pronunciation of inventory, um, as suggested by Stuart Stevenson. <laughs> That's noted. <laughs> <laughs> Would Stuart Stevenson uh, like to use the opportunity to wind press. up and press? Thank you very much. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 67 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. And I call Amendment 115 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 113. Would Claudia Beamish like to move that amendment? Not moved. Not moved. And the question is that Section 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Right, I call Amendments 68 to 71, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question been put in Amendment 68 to 71? No. 
The question is that amendments 68 to 71 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. And the question is that section 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Right. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. We're going to uh, conclude our committee's business today. At next meeting on the 25th of June, the committee will continue its consideration of amendments to the Climate Change Emissions Reduction Target Scotland Bill at Stage 2. Thank you.